Will you join me in prayer? Holy Father, hallowed be your name. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. This past week, <clears throat> I purchased and read a book entitled The Strange Death of Europe, subtitled Immigration, Identity, Islam. The author is Douglas Murray, whom I had seen on a television show, talk show, and his book is a highly personal account of a continent and a culture caught in the act of suicide. I found the book depressingly persuasive and I commend it to anyone who may be interested. One of the things Murray talked about was surprising. He lamented the death of faith in Europe and essentially said the cultures of Europe no longer believed in God nor truly valued their history and culture and thus were unwilling to defend what they had become. They had lost their reason for existence and seemed willing to be overwhelmed by Islam as if it were their due. Not all of them, of course, but their leadership in politics, culture, and art were leading and often driving an unwilling people over a cliff. What surprised me was his assertion that one of the roots of the problem was 19th century theological studies. Beginning in Germany, Scholars determined to study scripture with the tools of critical literary analysis. From those studies came what was called to be higher criticism, form and source criticism. From the theological se seminaries of Germany, higher criticism spread throughout Western Europe. Murray did not mention it. However, higher criticism soon leaped the Atlantic to transform and pervert American theological education. As one of my seminary professors was fond of saying, we are about 50 years behind Europe. He also said, if you can preach when you come here to study, you may be able to preach when you leave. <clears throat> now the great centers of theological studies in Europe most likely thought that they were advancing the gospel using critical analysis to strengthen the faith. What they did not realize was that turning scriptures from a revelation to be received into a puzzle to be deciphered would expose them to the most dangerous of temptations, intellectual pride, the essence of which is competition. Many of the texts I studied in seminary were written by professors arguing with other scholars about minutia. Of course, there were insights, but often I felt they missed the whole point of what they were studying. Learning more and more about less and less, they finally came to know everything about very little. Now, the six verses from the Gospel of Matthew, which are the texts for this sermon, are packed with three great profundities. Jesus begins by saying, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. Those words succinctly reiterate a constant theme of Scripture. It is not the wise nor the worldly learned to whom God chooses to reveal himself. Jesus was rejected by the scribes and Pharisees, but the common people, even little children, flocked to him. Jesus taught that the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek and the merciful, the pure in heart, those who were oppressed for righteousness' sake, those were the ones who were truly blessed. 
He told his disciples, who, by the way, were common, uneducated fishermen, that greatness among them was to be measured not by position or authority, but by servanthood. The greatest among them was to be the slave of all. And he pointed to himself as the example, kneeling to wash their feet and offering himself as a ransom for sin. The Apostle Paul addresses this issue directly in 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 18. <clears throat> for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The Apostle Paul continues, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, please do not get the impression that I am opposed to theological education. Many great servants of Christ have plumbed the depths of knowledge to the glory of God. We should all seek to know as much as we can about the revelation of Scripture. But I am cautioning about one of the great dangers. It's not a danger of intellectual striving, but of intellectual pride. As Alfred Plummer, Church of England clergyman and biblical scholar, has it, the heart, not the head, is the home of the gospel. Those who immerse themselves in study need to be keenly aware that there are sharks in those waters. Soon or late, they will be tempted to embrace what they think they know rather than what has been revealed. You know, it is not cleverness or knowledge that shuts out revelation. It is pride. And it is not ignorance or stupidity that opens to us the gift of revelation. Rather, humility. You see, when one opens Holy Scripture as a child, conscious of their own weakness and ignorance, the message of salvation comes alive with the power of the Holy Spirit. As the writer of Hebrews tells us, for the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Secondly, Jesus affirms the very foundation of the Christian faith. If you don't get this, you don't get anything. Jesus alone is the only Son of God. God the Father has given the Son all things, and no one knows the Father's will, purpose, nature, and being except the Son. If anyone would know God, they must come to that knowledge and enter into that relationship with the Father through the Son. Only those whom the Son wills can receive the revelation of the Father. And it is the Christian conviction 
that Jesus can and desires to give that revelation to anyone who is humble and trustful enough to open their hearts and receive it. The Gospel of John reiterates in different words this fundamental truth. I am, said Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. For as Jesus assures us, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So if we want to know God, if we want to see the mind of God, if we want to understand the heart of God, if we want to discern the nature of God and the will and purpose of God towards humankind, then we must look at Jesus. That is why the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us to fix our eyes steadfastly on Jesus as we run our race to the glory of God, laying aside the sins that so easily ensnare us, for Jesus is our example. He is the one who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, those who toy or entertain the idea that all religions are a path to God have badly missed the mark. They have departed from the cornerstone of the faith. They have stepped off the heart of the confession of Scripture. And their efforts, no matter how assiduous, will end in frustration and despair, for only in and through Jesus Christ can we come to the Father. Now, the third great truth Jesus proclaims is an invitation. Jesus throws open the door of heaven by urging all those who are burdened and tired and discouraged and desperately hungry to know God to come to him. If any person comes to Jesus, he will in no way reject them. For Jesus came at the will of the Father to grant eternal life to all those who will believe, trust in, adhere to the Son of God. As Jesus said in John 6, 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Jesus promises rest, peace, joy to those who take his yoke upon them. For to take his yoke is to enter into submission to him, to obey his commands and seek his will and grace in all that they do, serving their heavenly Father through the Son. To be yoked with Jesus, the Son of God, is not onerous, for the Spirit of Christ is gentle and humble, not arrogant or demanding. Now, it is true that as we join with Jesus in the redemption of the world, there is labor to be performed. But as a yoke mate of Christ, it is Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, who does the heavy lifting. And there is another great promise. The yoke of Christ is easy, which means that it is perfectly fitted to us. We wear it easily. The yoke does not rub us the wrong way. It does not chafe. It does not gall us. The tasks the Master calls each of us to do are a joy for us to perform. For Christ knows each of us intimately. He understands the hearts of those called to follow him. And as they rest in him, he transforms their labor into a labor of love. I will never forget the very first sermon I ever preached. It was on the 1st of April, 1962 in the Farmville Baptist Church in Farmville, Virginia. I was part of a three-person team from the Baptist Student Union at the University of Virginia. Now, at the time, 
the farthest thing from my mind was to be a minister of the gospel. I did want to be a faithful Christian layman. And truth be known, I was terribly afraid of being called to be a minister. Nevertheless, I had agreed to speak at a service. I had prepared as well as I knew how, had practiced my sermon in a room full of chairs. To say I was full of trepidation and nervous beyond measure would be a great understatement. I was literally sick to my stomach. However, when I started to speak, I felt that the Holy Spirit overshadowed me. It was like catching a wave. It was joy beyond compare. Although I would not submit myself to ministry for another two years, in my heart I knew with a frightening certainty that I had found the great purpose of my life. Now, since that time, I have preached thousands of sermons, led innumerable Bible studies, and served in challenging and diverse venues. But amidst the labor, and there was a great deal of it, I have had the joy of knowing that I was doing the will of the Lord that I was fulfilling the purpose for which the Heavenly Father had given me life. And I testify, His yoke is easy. I want you to think about your times of ministry. Many of you have served the Lord for years in a great variety of venues. You have used the gifts given by the Holy Spirit to edify and build up the body of Christ. Reflect for a moment in your heart on how your labor for the Lord has impacted your life and the lives of others. When you were being obedient to do the Lord's work, no matter the setting or content of that work, did you not sense the wind of the Spirit carrying you along? Were you not conscious that this labor was important, worthwhile, even exciting? Was there not great peace and purpose and joy in the labor of love the Lord had given you to do? I suspect the answer to those questions is a resounding yes. And I believe you join me in our testimony. His yoke is easy. And it is important to make our testimony, for such encourages and strengthens those whose labor for the Lord may be just beginning. Jesus gives rest to the soul. If I had a hundred lifetimes, I would want to spend all of them doing that for which the Lord had created me and called me. And God has granted me the joy of sharing this adventure with a soulmate whose love of the Lord and passionate faithfulness has been and is without reservation and without reserve. You see, God calls the weak and despised, the humble and those hungry for truth and life. And he equips and enables them so that no person may, vo may boast. Jesus is the only way to the Father. And all who the Father calls come to Jesus to discover that his burden is light and his yoke is easy. They that have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen.